Okay. And we're on. All right. We'll start here. It's always a little bit, it's hard to navigate because it doesn't look the same when I put it in PowerPoint mode. But this is 17B. This is the electrical. I, I mean, this is the functionality of the heart, which is within this. And I, I don't know that we, I, I really want to focus on the cardiography of it. And to that end, I'll give you everybody a resource. It is so easy. Okay. ECGlibrary.com. And there it is. So this is what I mean. And so you can, it's a very useful website that will give you a lot of irregular ones to look at. If you so choose uh, everything from bundle branch blocks to heart blocks, to hypertrophy. It's an interesting pathway called Wolf Parkinson White. Uh, all of those different things. And what it will show you is really what the underpinning of this is. And that's this the electrical activity of the heart. And we'll, we'll look at what a normal looks like and everything else. But sort of the frame is what you can get out of it. And we're so used to just seeing, you know, like you, you see a pattern on a TV show and somebody's in ICU and all of a sudden they flatline, everybody goes crazy. Uh, the reality is that most cardiograms, and they're not used as much today as they used to be, to be clear. Uh, I think that we're seeing it's now in medicine, there's a lot of additional diagnostic studies that are more specific. It's a good screening study and it's a good study if there's been damage to follow it up. But I think it, it, it's not quite used as, uh, as relied upon. Maybe that's the way to express it as it used to be. And this is what I didn't know anything about it. This is called the electrical axis to heart. Okay. What's normal? Hearts. Here, kind of the bulk of the heart pointing down toward like your left hip. Okay. So normally you would expect the peak of electrical activity to be here. When we look at the classic 12 lead EKG and we look particularly at lead one and lead and what's called the AVF. Okay. We, we will we'll basically be recording lead one. But when you do this, effectively what you're doing, when you place these sensors on either side, so you have a sensor here, a sensor here, a sensor here, a sensor here. So they were right and left arm, right and left leg, and we just call them the limb leads. Effectively what you're doing is you're creating a series of triangles. You're only looking at three leads at any one time. And so those triangles, when you look at, when we begin to look at the effectively what they call the R wave, which is the part the spike that points up, the direction it points is important depending on what lead it is based on the triangles it's creating. And so this way, if we see both one and AVF are positive, that's what that means, it's normal. Okay. And so there's other things it could be. So there's certain diagnoses that are associated with normal. Some that are normal with left, if it's left sided, means left and up, right sided, or completely opposite, what they call Northwest Territory. Okay. And you can see some of the diagnoses. So maybe this person has emphysema. Maybe you just made a mistake and put the leads in the wrong place, you know, which can happen, which is why you always double check things like that. Right axis deviation, maybe finding in children or tall, thin adults. Right ventricular hypertrophy, just to name a few, pulmonary embolus. Left axis, okay, emphysema again, uh, tricuspid atresia, okay, Ingest, in, injection of contrast materials, which we used to use when we did arteriography. Those are just examples of something as simple. And I remember when I was a student uh, doing a, a rotation at the vet's hospital, when one of the first year residents, what they called an intern back then, you know, all of a sudden looked at the EKG and took out his little notebook and goes, oh, that, that heart's in the normal position. I'm like, well, well, how'd you figure that out? And he began to show me this material, this axis and deviation. So you historically you could garner a lot from electrocardiography. So that's maybe the preface. And so as we go back and, and, and this website, I don't think it's ever changed. Okay. And what they should have somewhere in here is, I used to have it. The normal, there it is. It's not that new. So that's what that's what a 12 lead EKG looks like, a tracing. 
So the way they do it, each of these large blocks, okay, each little square in there is 0.04 seconds. So one, two, three, four, five blocks represents a second. You're, it's, it's roughly 25 millimeters per second that they do their tracing. And I'm sure now they do it electronically, but for years, and we have an old machine sitting up in the lab up there that never worked because we couldn't get a disc yet. It was the old floppy disc drive to try to make it. That's why what I'm using today, it kind of takes over for it. Effectively, you would, the paper would start to run, there'd be a stylus and it would record. And when you created the 12 leads, the limb leads were one, two, three, AVR, AVL, and AVF. Those were the three leads. And then you had the other six, B1, all the way through B6, are called, and you'll see the illustration, are precordial leads, where you put an additional sensor that you may or may not use over certain target areas, like valve areas or the point of maximum impact, and that's a 12 EDKG. So, for instance, well, I, once a year when I have my physical, they'll, they'll typically send me for one of these things. And somebody in a hospital will do it, you know, the usual, having a chest x-ray or blood test and do an EKG, boom, I'll get one of these. The reason I tell you they're not being used as much, here's what happened to me. I went, I probably could pull it up here easily enough because I think all my login information is on this computer anyway for my, my UPMC where they have all the tests. And it said, evidence of previous heart attack. I'm like, WTF? I get one of those back. And he says, unchanged since last one. And the last one said normal. And now this one, and I called up my physician. I probably made him retire. Because he retired about two months after. I said, you know, Fred, WTF? Did I miss something? Or more of it, did you miss something? He goes, no. He says, we see that a lot today because they machine read these. Basically, they're computer read. They scan them and computer read them. I mean, in the old days, you'd have... You know, a cardiologist, that would be, they get paid to do that. They'd read these, and, you know, they could read them as fast as you and I would read a, you know, a report about anything. You know, you'd read the stats from last night's game. That happened to my Nana. She was in the hospital, and she had, like, elevated heart enzymes, but she had a pacemaker in And someone was like, yeah, she got a heart attack. I'm like, she can't, because she has a pacemaker in you, you know what I mean? And they were saying, like, it was something different kind. But, like, that same thing, like, they kept telling her, you know what I mean? I know. It was, you know, like, like they told her, like, man, you got a heart attack. You're just lucky to be alive. And, like, she has, like, they didn't even know she had a pacemaker. Like, that's how bad the attending doctors were. So, sometimes it's a doctor. And I said, see, these days you're seeing a lot of things are machine read because it's, it's quote unquote, quicker and yeah. less expensive than hiring somebody to read those things. It's, 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 there's all little nuances today. But I always do this unit one because I, I, I kind of have fun with it. So, uh, Let's take a look at it, and if we can get, yeah, probably Chelsea didn't show up because she didn't want to volunteer. Is that what happened, Haley? I know you're not her keeper. That's terrible. Huh? Awful. Let me look. Let me look. Yeah, and we are recording. I always, I have to check. All right, off we go. So here we are. Electrical events of the heart, more or less. Okay. So as we're, we're going to look at this, the whole secret here, uh, you remember everything is about resting membrane potential. Normally those leak channels are fairly consistent and we can maintain resting membrane. They're a little more leaky here. And that creates effectively an auto depolarizing channel. So, I mean, that's the easiest way to understand what's going on. So gap junctions, because the signal goes from one cell to the other. And the fact that you have this, you know, it's, it's, it's this network of different kinds of cells, you have the auto rhythmic, which are no, basically the conducting system, which are non contractile, you have contractile cells, and then of course, you have supportive cells on top of it. So effectively, pacemaker potentials are the idea behind this. So in a pacemaker potential, potassium channels are closed, but the slow sodium channels are open and effectively into this, they're leaking in additional. So it's bringing it as soon as it reaches its, you love the word, it's nadir, 
you know, the bottom and it starts to work its way back up it. There's no leveling off or resting membrane potential per se. So what will happen is it reaches the trigger, it depolarizes, calcium channels open at around minus 40, huge influx of calcium. So it's a little bit different. Sodium channels leak, calcium comes in, leading to the rising fate, and then the potassium channels open. And you'll see the tracing. The first thing you can look at when it comes, notice it's not it's not so sharp of a peak. So the whole way this is, see, you have to think of that as rapidity, how rapidly it occurs. It doesn't occur quite as rapidly. So it sustains, you know, that action potential, let's say a little bit more in a, sort of in the area underneath the curve that's there. And you can see as it reaches at the bottom, okay, it immediately starts to come back up. And that's what's meant by pacemaker potential. So you have three areas in the heart that have pacemaker potential in the conducting system. You have your pacemaker assuming you're functioning normally, and at least half of you probably are, feeble attempt at humor that failed, I understand. Is So at, at that point, you have the SA node, known as the sinoatrial node, that's your pacemaker, for most of us it is. You have the AV node, which can sustain as, as rapid a heartbeat. And then another area, which are referred to, well, in the old days, we called them Purkinje fibers. Now they call it the subendocardial conducting network. So you will see that ever so shortly. So this is the sequence of event. It starts at the essay. Notice it takes less than a quarter of a second. That's the remarkable thing about the heart. We have the better part, if you want to think of how rapidly the heart beats, and typically about every three quarters or four fifths of a second, our hearts beat on average. Okay. Really the actual electrical activity, the actual quote beating of the heart is about a quarter of a second, if not a little bit less. And it has a mandatory quarter of a second rest period. That's this very prolonged. And we talked about it a little bit in muscle and nerve, absolute refractory period. It's a great con- the card has a great contract. Every time I beat, I get a quarter of a second off. All the time. How's that? That's like you get 15 minutes every hour. Break time. I'm going out. I'm not, the heart's not going out for a cigarette or anything like that. I'm just guessing. So there are the structures that are part of this network. The SA node or pacemaker. The AV node. The AV bundle, which is the only electrical connection between atria and ventricles, the bundle branches as that bundle divides going to the right and left. And then finally, what we used to call the Purkinje's, these fibers that basically are at the tip or the apex of the heart and sort of go up and around in all directions. So the heart is basically, it's a toothpaste thing, you know, squeezing from the bottom up. Right atrial wall, <clears throat> whichever going to be the fastest is the winner. And that's the whole idea of depolarization is the whole idea of de- defibrillation is that you're going to simultaneously depolarize all of the heart muscles. And when they relax, hopefully you'll basically resequence it and the SA node will take over. When the SA node is the predominant node and you have an SA node providing the impetus, we call that a sinus rhythm. So typically what you're going to see in sinus rhythm, you're going to see the SA node and then signifying the atria are firing, followed by the ventricles. That's what's a sinus rhythm. That's normal. Normal sinus rhythm is not the same. Norm, when I say normal sinus rhythm, it speaks to how rapidly. So a normal sinus rhythm by definition is that format, as you will see, we call it a P wave followed by a QRS. So these two electrical activities have to be sequential and they have to come every 60 to a hundred beats per minute. They have to be within that realm, unless you're dealing with somebody who's very highly physically conditioned and you have that knowledge beforehand and their resting heart rate can be a little bit low. That's it. So it's not, it's not magic. You can have a sinus rhythm and it doesn't have to be normal, but a sinus rhythm will likely sustain life while you can work on trying to get it back to normal. That's sort of the way to look at it. 
that's there. So typically the average time is about 75 times per minute. And again, this is my old sticking point about governance. Bodies are governed. Our unusual heart rate would be well over 100. The, the whole idea of the, of the innervation by the vagus nerve is to slow it down. And the slower, the slower it's slowed down normally within reason gives you a larger amount of reserve when you do need to use it, you know, uh, extensively and very, very rapidly. So it provides a lot of cardiac reserve if you want to consider it that. And so that impulse will go through the atria and eventually to the AV node. That's the rate determining step. That's the point where it's slowest. And what that is designed, why it's so slow, and it's because of the, the you know, basically the voltage-gated channels that are there, or in this case, that are not in abundance there. What it allows is for that signal to completely contract the atria, because what happens in the cardiac cycle, the atria basically top off the tank. There's very little blood in the atria, and the whole idea of atrial contraction, what it, it sort of optimizes performance. You're filling up maybe the last, oh, I don't know, 20%, which is, at most is about, is probably less than an ounce of blood to top off the atria so they can be optimally, maximally filled. And so that every time they contract, you get the optimal, same word, ejection fraction, which is roughly 57%. Typically, the atria, the ventricles are filled to about 120 milliliters, four ounces. And you eject not quite 60% of it, 57 and change. And that's optimal. Just to give you an idea of what this is all about. It's all about consider doing the same thing over and over. Heart, very important, boring. That's the best kind of thing. If you want to be, a, you never want to go to the hospital and have a doctor say, oh, you're a good case. That's not good. You want to be dull. You want to be boring. You want to be unexciting in the land of doctor. Yeah, they're normal. Yeah. And I, none of you have to worry about that. I can tell. You're not normal. Particularly. Okay. The AV node in the interatrial septum, approximately a tenth of a second. Fibers are smaller, fewer gap junctions. Make sure the atria contracts. It could take over if someone has damage to the SA node. But 50, perhaps a max of 60 beats per minute is insufficient for you to do a whole lot. You know, you could, you have effectively no reserve. You would have to be, the only things you could do would be very, very sedentary things. Really, it would be very hard for you to stress it at all. You just couldn't have the capacity to do that. The bundle, again, is the connection between the atria and the ventricles. You mentioned the pacemaker. Pacemakers effectively have to create that connection. You embed something in the atria and you embed something in the ventricles, and you have a connection, an electrical connection, man-made between them. The bundle branches divide going in their appropriate directions. And then the Purkinje's or subendocardial conducting network, more elaborate on the left, the left is thicker, more muscle, more oomph. Okay, that could conduct them at around 30 beats per minute. That's insufficient to sustain life. Okay, and so it comes up effectively from the apex back up toward the atria as we already talked about. And it's a very good illustration that shows it to you, I think. Gives you an idea of the locations that are there, the bundle branch, the, uh, the bundle itself, the bundle branches, and then down here and up in all directions. And they take you over. Do hickey. Which brings you to what defects are. So we're going to look down the road, and we won't get to it today. We will look back at this, and uh, whether I send it to you or just talk about it, uh, it'll have more to do with. with, with Really, there's one slide in all of this is just wonderful. And if this is slide, I think it's a slide 18. If there's one, it's like slide 50 or 57, something like that, which is the marriage of all of these. It shows what happens in the atria, what happens in the ventricle, what happens to the 
uh, the heart sounds, all the valves, all of that stuff at once. And that's really the, the picture of understanding the physiology of the cardiac cycle. So I maybe, I, maybe I'll get that in personally to you or separately as a point of emphasis. Okay. So what's an arrhythmia? They're not in sequence for whatever reason. Okay. So that's a typical arrhythmia. Fibrillation is rapid con contractions. And the problem with that is they're very inefficient. You don't have anywhere near enough time for the heart to fill, whether it's atria or ventricles. And eventually, it's pretty much doomed to having some type of what we would call a pathologic rhythm, one that's going to end up with big problems. And so in order to deal with that, you know, we, we worry AFib is a little more common and they try to treat that with medications to keep that under attention. When you have VFib, ventricular fibrillation, it's you know, that's a that's an immediate rhythm that's necessary to shock to defibrillate because that's where it derives its name i don't know that you have to do it for afib and, I, and frankly it, it it's i we didn't used to but again i i haven't recertified in cpr in 20 years so i you know, I'm, I'm, as my dad used to say i'm talking through my chapeau he's talking from your hat nowadays you say talking to your ass but I wouldn't say that in class. Shut up. Ectopic focus means when it's not the SA node, the junctional rhythm or nodal, N-O-D-A-L rhythm, is, are the same terms, 40 to 60 beats. Getting an extra beat is not that unusual, okay? And so what happens is it, it sort of, it, it, as long as they're not persistent and just occasional, you know, it, it's, it sort of makes it a slight degree of irregularity. When you start making too many of those, you create turbulence and turbulence leads to clot. And you can see absolutely the most common reason, probably more so these days than nicotine, <coughs> caffeine. And that's one of the things, uh, they get heart palpitations. They, you know, and I, I've gotten them. You know, because I you know, I don't drink nearly as much caffeine as I used to, but I still drink a fair amount. So what happens to reach the ventricles? You got to get through the AV node. That's a heart block. There are varying degrees of heart block. You'll see some illustrations of it. Heart block does not mean that it doesn't get through. It means it's not getting through effectively. So it could be just slow, not getting through as uh, maybe it's taking more than Typically, we, uh, we allot between 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds for the impulse to get through. We look at those little squares between three and five little squares to get through. It's If it is in ex excess of that or toward the, the, the five square end of it, we would call that a first degree heart block. That's just delay. If you get some impulses get through and some don't, depending on how many you can classify, but by and large, that's a second degree heart block. And if nothing gets through and you have that nodal rhythm, that's a complete heart block or third degree heart block. So I don't know what the terminology is today from a medical perspective, but we can, we can sort of subclassify those as to partial or total. And then unfortunately, if the ventricles based on those Purkinje fibers have their own rate, you don't get enough circulation. And that's, and, and years ago, they used to use a, car, a lot of cardiac medicines for arrhythmias. Most of them had terrible side effects. And as, te as the technology improved for pacemakers, they really got away from those. Very, very much so. So it's a, it's a significant change over time. S controls are fairly straightforward. We looked at those in autonomic. Okay. Sympathetic accelerates. Parasympathetic decreases it. Not a whole lot to say. They're showing you the locations of where the, the different fibers go to. Not a big deal at this point. And then, because I really wanted to fo focus more on this part, the contractile fibers, that illustration you looked at before was electrical activity with that leaky channel and then the wide, you know, the wide top from the calcium influx. This is the So understand calcium plays a role electrically and mechanically as well. So the contractile muscle fibers, which are really most of what the myocardium is, differ in from skeletal muscle 
and you're going to see because of this plateau. That's why it's more about, it's, it's about strength, but it's about endurance as well. So how, what happens at an action potential, fast voltage gated sodium channels. We were familiar with those big turnaround minus 90 to plus 30 by that. Then slow calcium channels. Okay. At plus 30, the sodium channels close, but slow calcium channels remain open, prolonging depolarization. So you're going to see that plateau again, a little different looking plateau. That's why calcium, particularly extracellular calcium, is of significance. When we start talking, like what I take for blood pressure, people use for heart as well. And I'm sure it helps my heart as well, for those that believe I have a heart. Dare I go into a chorus if I only had a heart? Just shut up. Nobody cares. Nobody thinks you're funny. So what I, I always say how much I like having this class and being here. Not today. So that's where calcium channel blockers help with cardiac <laughs> function as well. After about 200 milliseconds, okay, 20, yeah, 20 of a second, slow calcium channels close, voltage gated potassium channels are open. That will bring it back down to resting. Calcium is pumped both back into the SR and out of the cell. So it's just like smooth muscle. You have some that's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but you have a lot that's extracellular and off we go again. So action potential and skeletal muscle, a couple of milliseconds here, about a fifth of a second. The contraction, as you can see, about the same deal. Cardiac contraction, fifth of a second. Skeletal muscle, considerably less. Sustained contraction, efficient ejection, longer refractory period prevents what they used to call, you know, it's a heart, oh, I got a heart spasm. No, you don't, because you can't do it. And so you can take a look at the difference. Here's one, here's another. So look at that very sharp, rapid peak, but then that plateau, and then it repolarizes. So the tension, as you can see, tension being mechanical activity always comes after electrical activity. So the electrical activity first, and then whatever, you know, let's say that's, you know, less, you know, 30 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds later, whatever, we start to see the increase in tension. And you can see the tension subsides after the repolarization event. Which brings us to, I call it the EKG because that's what I learned. It was the cardio with the C or cardio with the K. So these days the ECG and EKG are the same. Okay. doesn't matter as you can see here. So it's all action potentials at a given time, not a single one. And typically we use the 12 lead as a way to look at it historically. I, again, having been out of a hospital for a long time, don't know. Okay. Usually what we did in an emergency room, this is 45 plus years ago. Okay. We, we, everybody's on lead too. It was easy. That was the, the classic one that you'd look at. Or if you had them up in IC or any of those places. And I didn't know a whole lot about it. That, that that kind of thing, but I, I learned with time. So what we're going to look at today, and hopefully we'll be able to simulate. I know everybody's looking at me. When are we gonna get out of here? I see you, dear. You know you you don't have to. I, I'm gonna send you the recording. It's okay. I, I don't mind if you sleep. Just where will the students sleep? Where they've always slept in the classroom. Horse feathers, 1932, the Marx Brothers. I will get the quote for you and play it on YouTube. There's a great line in that. Do you know who Harpo Marx was? He, he never spoke. He, he could speak just fine. But he played someone who couldn't speak. And he had this big old raincoat that had everything in it. And, you know, and, and he's in this very same movie, he's going, you know, young man, you're going to learn that you can't burn the candle at both ends. And what is he reaches into his coat and candle burning at both ends like that <laughs> without where would they be without me they wouldn't know they wouldn't know any of this stuff so 
we're going to look at the waves, the P wave, which is the SA node all the way through the atria, the QRS, because we P Q R S T is kind of how the lettering went to, which is ventricular depolarization. Notice the EKG is electrical activity. We don't use the term contraction or relaxation, relaxation. We don't use the term systole or diastole. Those are mechanical terms. Electrical terms are depolarization and repolarization. The atrial depolarization, P wave. The ventricular depolarization is the QRS. The atrial repolarization occurs then, but the ventricles, the signal overwhelms it so you don't see that. And lastly, the T wave is the ventricles, which are much more massive, repolarizing. We look at the PR interval because we want to see how long that's where we look for a heart block. We look at the ST segment because that's between where the ventricle is depolarized and is going to repolarize. When we see irregularities there, it typically means the ventricles have been damaged. What does that mean? Heart attack. Okay. So we want to look at that and we even look at the interval for Q and T, but the ones you're going to look at are that P wave and the length of it. We're going to look at the height of the QRS because it gives you an idea whether the heart is enlarged and a heart like any other muscle when it's too enlarged, it there's more muscle than there is space and it's harder to expand and harder to pump. Okay. So it's not an advantage. It's the law of diminishing returns. You, you want your heart to be in good shape. It doesn't, you don't want your heart to be muscle bound. And that's what the 12 lead looks like that you can see here. So, I mean, there you can see the, we call this the precordial leads because they're before the heart and you just palpate spaces. I don't know which ones are which, but all I know is, see, I have a rather, it's a, it's an odd condition called hirsuitousness of the chest. I got a hairy chest fur coat and hey, genetics. And so in order to get a good signal, they often have to shave off the hair. I had one lady when I was doing a stress test about, oh, this must have been the better part 20 years ago. Not only did she, she goes, well, we have to get a really good signal. So after she shaved the hair, she took steel wool and started, I think she enjoyed it a little too much. The spike heels gave it away. <laughs> I didn't say that. The cardiologist office, St. Margaret's. Now I was down at the heart lab. This is the tracing. PR interval. We want four of those little squares, what they're representing here, would be about right. We count it from here to here. You'll notice because there's such dramatic electrical activity, usually the Q wave goes down. Sometimes when you see exaggerated Q waves, that also speaks to an acute heart attack. Up here, this should not be any greater than a millivolt. If that is too large, that's an overly muscle-bound heart. Cardiomegaly are hypertrophic myocardium. Then you can see the overshoot and back here. The, 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 what we look for is ST elevation, if it starts here to come back down, or over depression where it doesn't come back to level. It kind of comes up at an angle. Those are all signs of irregularity. And those are quick things to look at from a, a medical perspective. And they give you a little, you know, each one of these little guys here kind of show you what's going on. I'm not going to go over it. So problems that can be detected. Enlarged R waves, that's what I was talking about, an enlarged heart. So if that's overly dramatic, so it shouldn't be whatever the scale is, typically one millivolt unit or one volt unit, I, I, I'd have to look that up. Elevated or depressed ST segment typically points to damage in the heart or ischemia, very often an old heart attack. Repolarization, again, ventricular arrhythmias, etc. So there's all manner of these. These are just some tracings. Why is this a normal sinus rhythm? Remember, normal speaks to the rate. So first thing you look at, why is it sinus? P wave. QRS, T wave. P wave, QRS, T wave. The T wave isn't essential, but the P and the QRS have to be one right after the other sequentially. 
And the best way is to count squares. And, and people who do this all the time, they already know what number this is. So let's say that if you look at, here's a square, here's on the line, 5, 10, 15, roughly 17. So they know that roughly 17 or 18 squares is about 75 beats per minute. With 25 squares, okay, you would know that it was, uh, you know, a beat a heart rate of 60, because that would be one second. So you look for that, so you count the squares in between them, and you, someone can look at that who's good and know right away, not only if it's a normal rate, but, you know, it could probably give you an estimate of the rate, because most of the time it's fairly straightforward. Notice, no P waves need apply. QRST. QRST. Notice the depression of the ST segment. Okay, notice the spacing. So you have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, better part of 30 squares. That's heart rate that's under 60. That's in that 40 to 60 realm of the junctional or nodal rhythm. And that, so you, the atria is not, that SA node's not working. Second degree heart block. Remember I told you before, it means some get through, some don't. Notice it's not a particularly impressive. Okay, so here, P wave, QRS, look at the depression, T wave, P wave, nothing. P wave, QRS, T wave, P wave, nothing. So one's getting through, it's like in every, it's like a two to one block. And I've seen three to one blocks and things like that. And then the famous bag of worms, oops, went right by it, B fib. So, and it's just that, a bag of worms. I mean, it's almost like you could reach in and feel the heart, and it's like you, you had, you could just feel, you know, a little boom here, boom here, boom here, nothing. And it's almost like it's, it's quivering, would be the way to describe it. And it's, and, it's, and, it, and it's alarming. And that's the organ, it's, so disorganized, you can't imagine that there would be any efficiency at pumping it out. So that's really, that's what that looks like. So we'll look at one of those. And I mean, hopefully we'll get, maybe we can get two people to do this. And, it's, and there's nothing to it. We're not, we're, we're just going to do the tracing and be done with it. So you can take a look and I'm, you know, all you guys who were at too much to drink last night and I had, well, I, you, you, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. No, they're not softball. I, I realize that. Period of heart contraction, systole. Period of relaxation, diastole. The cycle, okay? Blood throw, one complete heartbeat. Mechanical events follow electrical events. We have to look at all of these different things that are part of it. Other things that are noteworthy. So when do the ventricles fill? The valve, the valves that are the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves are closed in between beats. The back pressure has closed them after the second heart sound. So 80% of the blood passively flows because the atrioventricular valves are open. Atrial depolarization triggers that and tops off the tank, 20%. That leads this very important measure, end diastolic volume. We want to see how, if the heart is completely filled. Then it pressures up, okay? The valve sh slams shut, first heart sound, and it begins to eject, okay? That's what happens then. That's that isovolumetric contraction. Ventricles begin to contract. The AV valves close, first heart sound. So you'll see it's, it's, it's very, is a split second period where both ventricles are closed, all valves. Okay. So the semilunar valves and the AV valves are closed with the volume constant and the contraction that generates enough force eventually to overcome the semilunar valves as the pressure in the aorta reaches for most of us about 120 millimeters of mercury and it opens and that heart begins to empty. And the pressure increases. And you'll see that as well. So 
following ventricular repolarization, the T wave, they start to relax. And then we're left with another important measure. This is how we figure out the ejection volume, the end systolic volume, the volume of blood remaining in each ventricle after it's been ejected. As that pressure drops, those big elastic arteries, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, that rebound effect brings the blood back and closes the atrioventricular doors, second heart sound, and then we go right back to where we started. That's the cycle 101. What's interesting, when those valves, the aortic and pulmonary valves close, that they, as the door slams shut, the blood flow rebounds off it. And it generates an extra bolt of pressure you're going to see in the next slide, which is really a great slide, called the dichrotic notch. That is not an event on the EKG. That is a pressure change in the aorta itself. Without that rebound effect, what you would get is blood kind of flowing like this. So it would, you get the pulse of 120 would drop to 80, pulse of 120 would drop to 80. That's a lot of turbulence, that kind of pulse pressure. Turbulence equals clotting. What the dichrotic notch is, is it kind of softens that event. So what will happen is it starts to drop, all of a sudden you get an extra wave. It kind of holds it slowly, then we start to hold it, then an extra wave like that. So it, the beauty of that, and we'll see it in the next slide, is it, when I say softens the blow, it makes that sort of pulsatile nature less, less visible. And so the cardiac cycle is about 0.8 seconds, systole about 0.3, the quiescent period. What's that? It's like in individually quiescently frozen food. There it is. Uh, very faint. I love that slide. <laughs> Are you doing anything tonight? We can get there. Here's what I mean. The aorta, it's not pulsatile. So if you look at the green that's there as the meat, and we look at the median pressure as it gradually starts to drop. When we start the next cycle, it goes back up to 120. It doesn't drop to 80 right away. You have that notch. So it kind of creates this relatively long period all the way here rather than at pulsatile nature. You can see the ventricular pressure. Okay very distinctive in there. And then if you time this with the heart sounds, you can see when the door finally closes, then the pressure ramps up and finally it opens. And then as the blood begins to flow through the aorta and then at the dichrotic notch, simultaneous with that, more or less, we have the second heart sound. That's the door closing, create, effectively creating that notch. You get a look, the topping off is right here. So you can see all of those things are part of it. And you can even marry that furthermore. They used to have all those together and superimposed the, the normal EKG on top of it. Which they used to have with, with it. And I, you don't see it quite as much here, but they should. Now here, here you have the superimposition. Right up there. So you begin to see the P wave. And if you trace it back down where the heart sound would have been around here. The QRS, you can see that big hump up and then as it begins now you can see the dichrotic notch right around or shortly thereafter the t-way so that's the beauty of putting all of these things together the heart sounds first is louder than the second mitral valve slightly before the tricuspid i'm terrible at those at auscultating can't do it can't do it can't do it what's a heart murmur if it's, there's any kind of turbulence or irregularity. So whether it isn't closed, whether it's too narrow and there's different sounds, whether it's swishing as the blood's sort of regurgitating, or if it's high pitched, like a whistling sound or a clicking sound is being forced through, who knows? And this is some of the numbers we utilize for this, our cardiac eye, it's a big number. And we're gonna marry that 5.25 liters approximately to respiratory what's called the minute volume. So what's a minute, 75 beats a minute times the ejection of 70 milliliters of blood. So you get, if you do the mass, five and a quarter liters per minute. Okay, roughly that's, we 
your mini volume for most of us is around 500 milliliters of air. Okay. Maybe 12 breaths per minute. That's, that's six liters. So ballpark, they're about equal. You have to have that. So heart rate and stroke volume, that's the very famous formula. You should know that. For cardiac out, you should know that. So four to five times resting in non-athletic people, trained athletes, now you're up to seven times or eight times. Cardiac reserve is that big difference that's there. And so the output is affected by the stroke volume and the heart rate. Those are the two features that are in it. So it's pretty straightforward and you can look at that chart. So the big factors that affect it preload, how full is the heart? How does it contract? What's left in it afterwards? The same thing. So end diastolic volume, how, how well it contracts and what's after, what's the volume left after systole. And so things that play a role pre-stretched, this is a really important law. It's called Frank Starling's law. Okay. And it's the whole story. When you stretch a muscle optimally, you're going to get the maximum contraction. So that's, you have to stretch the cardiac muscle. If you overstretch it or understretch it, you don't get the maximum output that you need. So it's the length tension relationship. So at rest, the cardiac muscles are shorter than optimal, at least to a dramatic increase in contractile forces. We do stretch them. And the big player here so it goes back to the recurring theme, venous return. Slow heartbeats and exercise increase it. And there's a variety of factors that will increase the venous return, distend the ventricles, blah, 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 blah. Contractility, different things can do it. Sympathetic stimulation, calcium influx, cross bridges. So when you see inotropic, it means force of contraction. When you see epinephrine increases the force of contraction, also increases the rate. That's chronotropic. So inotropic and chrono other things, thyroid hormone, glucagon, epinephrine, digitalis, calcium levels. And so acidosis, something we had talked about in MCAT today, but we'll get into it again ourselves. Extracellular calcium, potassium, and this is where I take calcium channel blockers. So you can get an idea. They ain't give you one of these things. Afterload, the pressure in the ventricles overcomes. So back pressure from the arterial blood, pulmonary trunk considerably less. Hypertension, high blood pressure increases that afterload. So here's the positive and negative, autonomic nervous system, chemicals, other factors. Okay, and, and, you saw, and we've gone over this with autonomic sympathetic nervous system, beta-1s. Pacemaker to fire more rapidly, increase heart rate. And as you can see, it's going to change those volumes. So it's not optimal. And the parasympathetic is different because it has that chronotropic effect. Hyperpolarizes the pacemaker, opening the potassium channel, slows the heart rate. Little to no effect on contractility. And we, so again, that's the vagal tone. That's so important. I don't think the Bainbridge reflex uh, is that critical for our purposes. Hormones, thyroxin, the electrolytes. These are interesting. Uh, again, calcemia, whether it's hypo or hyper. And so there's a variety of different things where calcium and potassium, as you can see, are the big players. And when, uh, again, when you start to see this, this is really scary. That's how I keep reiterating the same point. Kalemia, potassium levels are critical. And then all these other things. Fetus is the fastest, females faster than male, exercise increases, body temperature increases. Brady is slow, tacky is fast. Congestive heart failure is just that. It congests. It's an inequality. Okay? So if it progresses to a point, eventually you're going to end up weakening the myocardium. If you can't get the blood either reoxygenated sufficiently or distributed sufficiently, you're going to have a problem. Okay. So whether it's atherosclerosis, okay, high blood pressure, heart attacks, cardiomyopathy, which could be from drugs or inflammatory changes, viruses, things like that. And what inevitably happens 
when the left side is weakened for whatever the cause, it backs up into your lungs. It's a plumbing problem. It's going to back up. If it's the right side, it backs up into your tissues. And eventually that leads to peripheral edema, whether it's here in the, in the abdomen or most often with gravity down in the legs. But if you get one, you're going to get the other one. So it, it doesn't matter. I mean, if it backs up into your lungs, now the blood can't oxygenate. The right side of the heart is trying to work hard to push it through congested lungs. It's going to weaken. And now both sides are good. So either side leads of congestive heart failure will lead to the other side of it. Uh, so that's just the nature of the beast. So it decompensates, and then there's a variety of ways to treat it. Amen. We're done with that. Now, let me, I just need a vo- request for a volunteer. Not you, <laughs> Dr. Jacob. See, that's what she. I'm going to do this one just to just to do the cardiogram so we can see. With that, it's really great to do it when somebody exercises, to tell you the truth. So here's where we have the basic setup, and hopefully we'll get it to work. Okay, so we just we just want to basically get this where where these are, and and all you need to do is we get a red on the left. It doesn't really matter on the wrist, black on the right, green almost anywhere else abdomen down your leg so somebody can bring a chair over and sit here and that's all we got to do we don't have to really do the pulse sensor uh we could do it it's not to me it's not a big deal but i i could i can do the pulse. Where's, where's the pulse sensor go oh yeah it's that little finger i hate to use technical terms ah all right Please have somebody. That's why she didn't come in. Mm. Somebody volunteer? One would be fine for now with this crew. I'll go up. Well, come on. Join the party. Bring up, roll up a chair. I'm not going alone. You're not going alone? Nope. Okay. Okay. Thank God. Uh. Uh, why is it such a chore? I need to do a test. I mean, it's non-invasive. No one's going to get hurt. Oh. I feel like I'm asking for the world. No. All right. Find a place where there's no. Uh, okay. So here, I'll read you the instructions, and you can do them. Oh. So I mean, I got the wrist here. I got the leg. Okay. So slide over to this. Just peel these off. So I will read them to you. I don't know. So there's no part of my life with no hair. <laughs> It's basically on your on the wrist area, you're fine. So red on the left, black on the right. Just shove it on me. Just, just lay it on. Just. Yeah. Oh, okay. Take hold of it. Yeah. Just build. You ever done this before? No, I'm a plant scientist. I'm just. I know. I could like tell you a flower. Like smell there. Perfect. Cool. Red on the left. Black on the right, same area. And then the green can be anywhere. You can put it on your leg. You can put it, you know, anywhere on your torso, as long as it's on the skin. Good. Okay. And then. I got that summer broad, so we can. And then the best thing to do with this. Yeah, yeah he needs to cook it. Is now we just need a, any finger, probably a thumb to probably work out this. Yeah, 
Okay, January 13th. Click, okay, click the record button and auto scale on the tool bear. All right, you're ready. All right, here, here, here. We're ready. Let's get ready to rumba. All right, so make yourself cozy and comfortable. Let's see what happens. See, and you're starting to. You only be moving around. Am I alive? Yeah, you're. Oh, yeah, because you can start to see. There's a little bit of, and I'm exper- I may have to get this adjusted, but we'll be able to see this and get the rate. Okay, so you can be able to see these. And you can see where your pulse is is fine between 70, 60, you know, within a realm of error. And you can see the amount of that. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's hard. We're getting a little bit of motion, but this is, that's great. All right. That's one. And I can put that together. Okay, you can. You guys can change places. Yes. Right, stick them on. It's nice and like starry forward. Here's that one. <laughs> now here, here. Let's give you another. Nice now you can, we can get rid of these. So let's pop that off. Sorry, the, the other guy already. Doesn't matter. It's on the skin. What's gonna hurt? Really? Yeah. Two. Ooh. That one, I, I definitely get. <laughs> Here, Just one more. All scar on my side. And the green one goes on. Two. Thank you. You know you're alive. Can you can you put on the thumb uh, one for me? I heard. We'll do a check here. So, and so you want to be as still as possible. I'm I'm getting a lot of it. What I've noticed in these rooms, when you see that sort of vibration. And I, and I, it's, I've noticed that more in these rooms here. I'm trying to get something to do, deal with that. What we're going to probably do is I have a ground that I can plug in here that might work. So we'll see. Yeah, uh, that can be anywhere. Thumb is fine. Anything like that. We're all still. Oh, there's a hole there. So you guys can compare voltage levels you can also do time by moving like these red cursors are you ready are you all you all set yeah yeah it's it's your heart rate's a thousand That's oh. <laughs> that's odd okay let's try that again hold on we, we can discard that Make sure. Hmm. <laughs> Let's do it this way. Let's just we'll X out of that. I'll just restart the whole. There was an EKG from the past. You can see that. 
As soon as that loads up, hardware is found. All right. Okay. That's odd. I'm, 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 where's the pulse? Oh, maybe I was the wrong one. Hold on. No, 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 no. I mean, I can, you can calculate the pulse, but I had the wrong one, I think. I'm sorry. Okay, let's try again. Oh, there we are. You see, that looks a little bit more like normal. I can see that the scale looks a little bit more like a scale. Yeah, your heart rate went up a lot all of a sudden. Oh. Why are you so nervous? Because you're not sure what I'm talking about. Hmm. Huh. This one it could be working out better. All right, I'll be. I'll have to troubleshoot this. I, I, I'll. I'll send you guys a different one to take a look at. All right, we're good. I don't know why this is not behaving itself, but periodically things like that happen. All right, everybody, we're set. Let me end this. You're done.